Hi everyone, my name is Rachel. I host Welford Weaves here on the Woolen Spinning YouTube channel when I get a chance and when I get an opportunity to sit down and record and talk to you about what I'm working on. What's on my looms, what I'm planning, what I'm thinking about, all those different things. So I had kind of left you uh, with some projects in progress, some things that I was thinking about last episode. It's been a while. I thought that maybe once the summer got going and things got sort of settled with the kids that I would be able to come in and record, have a chance to sit down and talk to you guys and just sort of take those moments out of our day, maybe even just a few times throughout the summer to be able to do that. And I didn't even get one opportunity. I think there was one afternoon where I sat down and I turned on the camera and it was about two minutes of like, hi, welcome to the channel. And then the kids started interrupting and it was back to square one. So I turned the camera off, recognized that the season was not upon me to be able to record and talk to you guys. And here we are. So. Uh, again, my name is Rachel. Thank you so much for being here. If you have not checked out Woolen Spinning before or you've not seen a Welford Weaves episode before, there are a copious number of episodes of Woolen Spinning. In terms of Welford Weaves, it was something that I started last year as an opportunity to take some of the weaving content off of the podcast to keep the podcast really spinning centric and to bring some of my ideas and thoughts around weaving over here to Welford Weaves. So at this point it will remain on the same YouTube channel, but maybe in the future we'll separate the two. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. So welcome. Um, I have been working on a lot of stuff and nothing has been getting done. So I don't know if you've ever experienced that or if you've ever been in that stage of life where you feel like you've got something going on from, from every avenue and every angle of life and you've got more things infringing and pushing in on you and yet nothing really seems to ever get done. So that is where I am. So I just thought I've got a five minute window here. I can sit down, I can record, I can update you, and then we can have an opportunity to at least begin having this conversation again. So today I would like to just update you on what I'm working on, the things that I'm thinking about, and then as we sort of get close to Christmas time, hopefully those episodes will become a little bit more uh, focused and a little bit more uh, topic centric. So I'll have like a specific topic that I'll be talking about and hopefully you guys will find some interest and some value in that. So, and if you would like to have an opportunity to support the work that I do here and support uh, the things that happen here, please go ahead and check out uh, patreon.com slash wool and spinning. I really appreciate it and I appreciate you taking the time to, to head over there and have a look at the content that we're working on. Most of us aren't single into a single craft. We, we're multi-craftual, we do multiple things and sometimes it's hard to cram all of that content into one avenue and one you know podcast episode or one audio uh, recording or audio uh, audio clip. So to be able to kind of spread myself a little bit thinner, to be able to have a couple of different shows and a couple of different things that we do here means that I can, you know, add value for you guys and uh, hopefully sort of have an opportunity to, to uh, um, you know, teach you a little bit about what I'm working on and what I'm doing. So let's get into it. So I have a few things that I'm thinking about and a few things that I'm working on. So one of the really big things is spinning and weaving a coat. Um, I would like it to be quite a heavy, thick uh, coat. I, it will be fully lined. It will be sort of a cocoon shape. That sampling and that working through that hand spun process and working on that sort of bigger vision, if you will, is mostly going to happen on the regular podcast episodes on wool and spinning. I've just started talking about that on episode 252. If you are not sort of up to date on the podcast or it's new to you and you haven't watched before, um, episode 252 is where I start talking about my coat. And uh, specifically, I'm working with a fiber called Toothy. So if you ever see that fiber listed in the title, I'm probably talking about the coat. So that is sort of going on in the back burner or on the back burner. Uh, just a constant steady progress of something that I'm working on. The second thing that I wanted to talk about was a lace workshop that I took recently. Uh, I just wanted to sort of give you some reflections and, and let you know how, how it went and how it was. 
and uh, some of the things that came out of that that was my own work as a result. So I think we'll spend the majority of today talking about that. But I also wanted to share with you a new project that I just sort of started to throw on one of my looms. I just recently acquired another loom, so I have three floor looms at this time and two table looms at this time. Uh, so the floor loom that's sort of new to me is an eight shaft Leclerc Jack, and it probably will eventually go to live with my friend Kelly because I'm just running out of room. Um, I was really hoping that it would be a really good fix for me for a couple of things that I'm uh, struggling with in terms of like having enough shafts and, you know, just the type of projects that I want to work on and the type of things that I'm planning, but it's just ended up being one too many things in our very small space. So it means I need to spend a lot more time organizing my projects, planning my projects, making sure that they go onto the right loom at the right time. Uh, and that it's the right project for that loom. And uh, that even if it means putting a project on the back burner for a short period of time, just so that I can free up a loom because it's on something, a project is already on that loom. So working through some sort of just logistical things of really optimizing my equipment and using it in a really timely manner that things that are four shaft go on the four shaft jack. Things that are eight shaft go on the eight shaft jack and things that need more than eight shafts go on my Luet Spring, which is a 12 shaft 14 treadle. So I just need to really work toward optimizing that workflow and it, it's just going to take time. So um, I do have that project to kind of share with you. It's on the new loom. It's just in the process of being threaded and I thought I would just share it with you so that you can see the progress over the next few, probably over the next month. It'll probably take about a month to finish. The deadline, it, I have a hard deadline for that project. It has to be done for Christmas time because it's two blankets for the kids. So let me introduce those two projects to you. Let me chat with you and update you on those things. And I will uh, see you back here in just a moment. So a project that I really wanted to share with you guys today that I've been extremely excited about has been the idea of a huck stole, huck spot. So a huck spot stole. That's very, that's a bit of a tongue twister. Uh, the reason for this is I was in San Joe Silk here on Granville Island uh, in Vancouver a number of months ago and I was talking with Diana Sanderson who's the owner of San Joe Silk and trying to sort of, and I was looking through the discount bins and looking at the yarns and whatnot. And she had this absolutely beautiful uh, skein and uh, this is 100% Tassar silk, uh, 25 over one. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a singles. I'll hold it up closer to the camera so you can see that. It's a singles yarn. Um, it's spun in India and she, this is 95 grams of this yarn and she had it uh, on sale for $5 Canadian. So it's like $2 American. <laughs> I'm kidding, but it's, it's cheap. Um, they were clearing it out. It was um, so some yarn that they had carried for a while. And I ended up for $5, I was like, I'm gonna get three skeins and I'm just going to have it uh, enough that I can play with that I don't feel really invested, that I don't feel like if I do anything with it that messes it up, that it's going to cause a big problem. The thing with a lot of uh, the weaving that I have found, like from right from when I started, was that uh, I was, I've been really worried right from the get go about messing up and ruining things. And I just got my unit three back from the OHS, from the Ontario Hand Weavers and Spinners Master Weaver program. And I didn't do as well as I had hoped. Um, I knew that I wasn't handing in my best work. I knew that the summer was absolutely crazy and that it completely got away from me. I also knew that I needed to be really gracious with myself and let myself off the hook and that it was okay that it wasn't my best work, that I needed to get it handed in and um, accept the consequences, if you will. My wall hanging, which is worth 50% of the mark, was not my best work and I should have redone it. 
and I got to the end of that linen warp on the Louette Jane and like nothing was working. Threads were slipping. Um, I had lost really good tension on the warp. I didn't have enough warp to weave a really good header for that wall hanging. And everything that she gave me as feedback was exactly it, it, what I would have written if I had marked myself. That said, I learned a lot and I created one piece, particularly my transparency, that while she didn't um, give me a very good mark for, I was really proud of. And um, I didn't, she felt that I didn't have enough negative space in the piece. So with transparencies, they work because there's um, light coming through around the shapes that you're weaving. And she felt that mine was a little bit too much like a tapestry, which when I, when I see it and when I look at it, that was actually what I was concerned about when I was uh, submitting it, was that it was a little bit too much like a tapestry. Um, that said, I, I feel like with weaving, um, that because there's this feeling of all of these materials and all of this stuff going on in the loom and this feeling of like wrecking the yarn, not being able to salvage it. It's not like with knitting where you can just rip it out. Um, and I've never felt like that before with my knitting or my spinning. I've always felt like with my spinning, if I spin a yarn that I'm not super happy with, it's like no harm, no foul. There's more sheep, there's more fleece, there's more wool. Somebody will, will dye a braid that's similar enough that I can spin that again. But with the weaving, it hasn't felt like that. And I think it's because it takes so much to set up the loom and you have such a huge amount of front end work. And so what I've started uh, doing is trying to think of my projects as being more like stepping stones. So I took this awesome workshop on these lace weaves and we talked about the progression from plain weave through to basket weave, through to canvas weave, which I have a whole project planned for canvas weave that I really wanna make, um, some Halloween tea towels, which it's October already, so I don't know if those are gonna happen, but I even thought just a really short little warp of like three yards to make some Halloween little hand towels, like even if they were like just little hand towels um, in canvas weave. And then we worked from canvas weave through to huck, and then from huck we went all the way through to Swedish lace. And then on, a, on two of the other looms, we had Bronson set up and Spot Bronson, um, which was fantastic to see it all kind of come together and how these weaves work together. And we'll talk about this more in future projects. But when I got home, I had been responsible for warping up the uh, Huck Spot. No, the Bronson Spot. So when I got home, I had this sort of, you know, 90 ends on my loom of Huck Spot, but I, kind of felt like I had done my learning around Huck spot, uh, around Bronson Spot. Um, I felt like I had sort of seen what I needed to see on the loom for Bronson Spot. I felt really inspired by it. Um, and I really liked it, but I, I, I was really kind of caught up in this whole Huck thing. I was stuck in Huck. And so what I did was I took half of the warp and I removed it. I pulled it out of the reed and I, I I put it off to the side. I actually did just a really simple knot to hold that side of the warp together. And then I got myself into Fiberworks and I, with the other half of the uh, warp, I had about 45 ends to play with. I ended up in the end using about 60, about. And I started going through all of the different drafts and, and all of the different things that you can do with Huck. So what I ended up with in the end was these five sort of bookmark style uh, samples as a result of taking this workshop with my friend Barb Mitchell. And if you don't follow Barbara, please go to spinweaverbarbara.com. Uh, her blog is just an unbelievable wealth of information. It, there's lots of stuff to read on there. I would highly recommend that you go and check her out and give her a follow. So that's spinweaverbarbara.com. So I ended up with all of these little samples from this learning of, and just really got into the weeds with Huck. And I maybe what would be helpful is to show you what I did in Fiberworks so that you can see where all of this came from. And you can see at the very bottom here, right below me, uh, I put stickers on everything. 
yo ala jane stafford style um, so that i could keep everything straight rather than using my little hanging tags that i always used to use i've kind of switched over to these little stickers and and kind of ripped uh um that really helpful uh bit of um uh technique that jane does with her with her samples and barbara does it as well barbara barbara is actually part of jane stafford's dream team so uh, Barbara is just an unbelievably accomplished weaver. So right straight below here, you might be able to see written on, on my little tag um, is just pure Huck lace. And I did some Huck lace towels a few years ago. I gave them all away as gifts because I wasn't actually very happy with them. And I felt like I had sort of learned something, but I, I, I felt like I was missing this huge piece of knowledge around Huck that I was having trouble amassing on my own. And um, I really feel like a lot of those um, gaps were filled in for me in this workshop. It was a two day, all day workshop. So that right there is um, Huck lace. And then next to it is Huck spot. And Barbara had some absolutely beautiful pieces that were Huck Spot that she had woven that were previous projects that she had made. And what I love about Huck Spot is on the one side you have your your weft floats and on the back side you have your warp floats. So I wanted that to be shown in the sample that you could see those two on the bottom and the top. The Huck Spot weft floats are on the bottom. On the back of that same piece will be the, the warp floats. And then above it you can see what it looks like when it's the warp uh, floats and of course if you flip that over on the back it would be weft floats and then I started getting into the the last three were all about experimentation and combining all of this stuff what happens when we just have warp floats with lace what happens when we have weft floats with lace what happens when we make a grid and we superimpose them over each other what happens when we weave a little bit of you know huck lace for a while and then we do some lines and we do some spots and we do some graphics and all of a sudden this whole world started to open up and I started to really feel like I understood how Huck works which is huge. So like I said I got onto the computer I got onto Fiberworks and I started working out what works and how it works and I first of all did my lift plan um, so that I kind of had an idea of what I would be working with. You know I, I set up my plain weave which is over on the far side there. And then I set up my huck lace, which is where we lift one and two um, and versus three and four. And then I set up my um, spots, which is where we're only lifting one or four. And then I set up my um, uh, uh, sort of more complicated stuff where you can get into patterns and lines where we're lifting, you know, two, three, and four against one, two, and three. And so you can see in the upper corner there, there's my lift plan and that's what I was working with. And those are all the different combinations of what you can do with Huck. And what often ends up happening, and I think Jane Stafford talks about this in the online guild um, when she covers Huck, is that if you only have six treadles, you do have to combine treadles. Um, so you might have to sort of combine your treadles and, and do that if you don't have the number, you know, if you don't have eight treadles to be able to create all these combinations yourself. That was one nice thing about working on the table loom. For all of these samples, I could lift whatever I needed to lift. Um, and it was surprisingly fast. So one advantage to doing samples like this is you don't need all the treadles. You don't need to warp up your floor loom. You can just do them on your table loom and do a direct, a direct uh, tie up. And then up above, I was like, okay, so if I want to have a plain weave border, what does that look like? I need to lift one against four to create my, my plain weave. Um, because in our huck, in our huck lace there, we've got one, two, one, two, one, and then we've got four, three, four, three, four. So what are the threads that we need that are on um, every other um, shaft that are gonna give us that plain weave? And in this case, in this draft with this uh, draw down for for huck it's one against four and that will give you your plain weave so every time you go back to one against four you're going to have plain weave so that dictated my tie, my my threading so i re-threaded and i pulled off the old warp and i re-threaded and i ended up creating this instead and that's what gave me this um draw down and so i printed this off and i took it to the loom with me and I made it and I ended up with that the 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 um, uh, the, the the lace bookmark and then I ended up with just below it the weft spots and then I had the warp spots 
Um, so I did that and figured out how those treadles work and what that would look like to create that and really paying attention to what's being lifted and what's being lowered. And also how we get that staggered effect. How do we stagger them uh, so that we get the plain weave around our spots so that we create that classic drawing in and curving of huck. And then I thought, well, if we can do that, maybe we could create lines because we don't have to stagger. And so because I could see in the warp in the in the uh, lace right here that things were starting to line up. So if I can create spots, maybe I can create lines, which I've seen in other pieces of weaving. So it's like just figuring out how to create that. And that was the result of the fourth one down there in that fourth design. And then it got really fun. Then it was like, well, if I can do that and I can create lines all in one direction, all on top of each other and stack the uh, weft floats on top of the warp floats like a lattice, maybe I can stack them in a lattice and offset them. <laughs> Whoa, hold the phone. So that's what I did here. So I really started to play with the lifting plan at that point and really trying to figure out, okay, if I have uh, warp spots, and I want weft spots to line up, what do I need to lift next? I was just playing around with shifting things around and how does the plain weave work so that I can have, um, you know, a, a, a row of lace and then a row of just huck warp floats and then a row of weft floats and then uh, huck lace again and how does that all work? And then being able to see it at the loom actually working on the loom and seeing how that happens. If you look on this photo, if you look at the very, very far sample, it's way over at the other end, um, that big long one, uh, that one I really started to play and I didn't follow any kind of pattern that I had made in Fiberworks. I was just trying to figure out how it all works. If I, you know, lift, if I make warp floats, what happens if I try to make weft floats that are um, you know, in the same place or in slightly different places and how does that all work? Um, and that, I think that by then making that fourth one, the, uh, fifth one actually, I really started to understand and I really started to get it. So after all of this sampling and after all of this work, I felt really empowered to be able to go back to my little book um, and I'll tell you guys more about this little book in just a moment when we talk about double weave, um, to go back to, the, to, to my little book and to start writing in my book uh, what I could actually do with this. And one of the reasons why I want to work with this yarn is it's new to me. It's gonna be a little bit challenging because it's so fine. It's about, I think I wrote it down, it's about um, 55 wraps per inch. So I'm looking at an initial set of about um, what did I write down here? An initial set of about 27 ends per inch as a place to start my sampling. And I'm looking for a 50-50 weave. So I want it to be a 50-50 balanced weave. Um, that's how Huck is woven. Um, most of the laces are woven as 50-50 weaves. And um, that's where I'm gonna start. So I, what I started to do was to get this into balls and get this wound. Um, because it is an unbelievable amount of yardage and it takes forever to wind balls. So uh, each of these is, I wrote it down, 3,000 yards per pound. So it's just an unbelievable amount of yardage. And I thought that probably the best thing to do was to hold two ends so that it doesn't get too tangled on the loom and keeping my warps and my warp chains and whatnot relatively small so that um, nothing gets tangled because this is singles. Uh, and um, I don't want to have a really super long warp. Um, I think my initial thought was to warp about um, yeah, about, about three, uh, three and a half, almost four yards, um, and not too, too much longer than that so that I can keep it organized, get the warp on really well and focus on just really good quality, uh, warping, really good quality weaving so that I can get as much information about this yarn and about this project as possible. And the weaving will actually be quite easy because once I get everything threaded, uh, the threading is super easy. It's, it's you know, one, four, one, four, one, four, one, four for the plain weave borders. And then it's one, two, one, two, one, 
434341212121 all the way across the 655 ends. All multiples of five, really super simple. Um, I'll have a uh, 10 threads on each outside border. Um, so that's, you know, 1414 for, for those 10 threads on each side. So very, very simple. And it's a really good way of being able to check your, war your warping, your threading as you're working across. If you're working in five thread increments, you can, you can check your work really, really quickly to make sure that your threading is correct and then it starts to go faster and faster. Um, this is going to be a long-term project. My plan is to hopefully put this onto the spring. We'll see. I, I'm, I, I need to get the spring free first. It has the have draw towels on it. And to be honest with you, I just have not had a chance to really sit down and spend some time working on that warp. So the have draw towels will be a topic for another day. And in the meantime, Let's talk about double weave. Uh, this was a uh, crocheted project that I started and I was looking through my photo archives and looking through like to find the photos of where the, this project was. And I thought for sure it was in 2018. I was like, I know it was pre pandemic. I remember going to the yarn shops and, and finding these colors. I remember seeking it out. It's Barocco vintage before you guys ask. Um, it's in the, the colorways uh, Cracked Pepper, grapefruit sunshine something like that mushroom and aqua so those are the five colors that are in this blanket and it was called the love actually hexy love actually blanket by uh, green letter day I think it was green letter day press I think I've seen she's still around and she's still active on Instagram and stuff so it was a crocheted hexi project. Um, you make you know hexagons and then you sew them all together and crochet them all together. As I made this blanket and as I got further into it, and like I said, I thought that I started it around like 2018, but I was looking through my photo archives and it actually was started in 2015, photographed in 2016. And then that was right when social media was starting to really be a thing. And I started to post about it around the beginning of 2017. So this project's been in the making for a long time. The problem and what uh, the reason why I stopped working on it was number one, the sheer size and the weight of it, the amount, just the sheer unbelievable amount of yarn that it was using. Um, I think in the end, I ended up purchasing about 11 skeins of yarn because I needed so many of the mushroom color. And the other thing was, and I remember talking about this on the podcast, was because of the superwash quality of the Barocco Vintage uh, and the slippery nature of it, I was sort of at the uh, uh, pivot point of deciding whether I was going to continue working on it and continue constructing this thing or and start putting glue where the ends were being woven in. And people from our community gave me lots of feedback around what they do with these projects. Um, because as it got heavier and as I continued to work on it, I was like sitting with it as a blanket on me. And as I'm working on it and sort of pulling on it a little bit, just like the kids would if they were curled up under it watching a movie, the initial uh, hexagons that I had crocheted that I had made that were more in the center of the blanket, they were coming undone and they were becoming up and they were unraveling. So I've got this big piece that's about a third of the way done and the center of it is all unraveling. And I take great pride in really weaving in my ends well. I even started knotting my ends and it was still that pressure and that pull and that weight of the blanket was still coming undone. This would have been great if I had taken on a smaller project and I had finished it um, as more of like an infant blanket when the kids were babies and when they were first born, rather than trying to do a lap size blanket with um, their sort of wanting to curl up under it now as older kids. It's just structurally not uh, the best thing and I'm never going to finish it. It's not the colors in our house other than the yellow and the gray. Uh, and uh, I love the blue and the grapefruit, but it's very primary. It's red, yellow and blue. And it's, it doesn't really speak to me. And I thought, what's another way? I have 11 skeins of this. What's another way that I could use it up? And you guessed it. I decided to reinvent it as a weaving project. So as you're looking at the pretty photos going past you on the screen, I'll just sort of give you a little bit of background. 
our local guild, uh, me and my friend Kim McKenna, who you may know from the School of Sweet Georgia, are the education and program uh, sort of uh, committee holders for um, that work that we do in our guild. And uh, I, for this year, we wanted to start sort of a program that we've been thinking about for a, a while and, and that I've been really dreaming about and just wanting to get up and off the ground. So this year, for the first time, we are hosting a double weave study group in our guild for guild members. And as a part of that study group, I'm hoping to finish the uh, uh, Guild of Canadian Weavers double weave problem uh, that you have to solve. I think it's number 14. It's in the intermediate portfolio. So after you finish your basics portfolio, you have an intermediate portfolio to do next. And uh, double weave is one of those assignments. And so this year, my goal by the end of the year is to have my double weave sample ready to submit as part of my larger portfolio. And I haven't done a lot of double weave. I've only done double weave um, as as sort of the last tail end bit of the warp. And I would really like to get sort of some more experience with, you know, making sure my that fold edge is really lovely and just, you know, really putting it together as like a really nice project um, and, and making a couple of blankets as sort of a, a warm up, if you will, of getting myself started. So that's what these, this yarn is going to be. So I still had about six, seven, six or seven skeins that were still in skein form. So I wound those up and I made those into a warp. So let me show you those photos next. All right, so I took uh, all of those yarns that were in the skein form and I wound them into center pole balls and I started making a warp. So I made the warp chains and I held one color of each for each square across the length the width of the blanket so that uh, when you fold it out the colors will sort of repeat if you will so it'll go you know mushroom all the way across to the cracked pepper and back again so it'll be sort of like a repeat uh, two stripes. You can see it here on the loom. So after I had wound those five warp chains, because that's one one sort of stripe was all that would fit on my blend on my warping board, which was totally fine. Once I had them all um, sort of ready to go, and they're not that long. It's two blankets. That's why I didn't bother chaining because just below this photo on the ground are the bottom of the warp chains. So I couldn't actually have it chained up and get it onto the loom, if that makes sense. So this is my new to me eight shaft Leclerc Jack loom. It's a Nihilus. Um, my other one is a Nihilus two, so it's the much taller, bigger one, and it's only a four shaft. Um, this one is the eight shaft, and um, uh, I was trying to figure out with this one where to put the rattle. It's there's nowhere really intuitive to put the rattle, so I put it down below at the bottom. Uh, there you can see it really well in this photo, and I'm not sure that that was the right place to put it because as we were warping, a couple of the uh, threads jumped and they jumped into other slots, even though I had like a block, a piece of yarn holding them down up above, it, was, it, it wasn't enough to have everything jump off. So I think maybe trying it on to, at the top of the shafts like I do on my other loom would be the way to go um, because as soon as we lifted up the warp chains, like I said, everything kind of shifted and moved. Uh, you can also see that there's that big thing of yellow in the middle. That's because the two stripes of yellow are in the middle of the blanket going down the middle of each side. So uh, for the yellow, I was holding one pick of each. So that's kind of what it looked like getting it onto the loom. It is wound on the loom now and ready to be threaded. And that's kind of the next step in my progression. And I'll share that with you next episode. These are my notes. So I use this uh, little, you know, I found this at Dollarama uh, here in Canada. I don't know if there's Dollarama in the States or not, but, um, you know, it was a $2 little book. It's little, <laughs> little llamas, um, and, or sorry, sloths doing, uh, and llamas doing um, yoga and whatnot. It's just really cute. And I was originally going to give this little book to my daughter, but she actually picked a different one. And I just needed a book to start to really keep track of what all the projects are that I'm working on, what needs to go on the loom next, what needs to happen. Uh, this, I, I, you don't need to see this up close, but this first page is all of the projects that I'm working on right now at this time, things that I wanna have finished in the next little while. Uh, the, due, the, the due dates, the, you know, uh, when do I need to get it on the loom by, what needs to be threaded by when, all that kind of stuff. So these are the two 
uh, pages that I that were the planning for this double weave blanket. So um, you can see at the top there I wrote uh, Louette Spring. I've ended up putting it on my Leclerc Jack, um, so I need to change that. But I was holding the yarn under tension, sort of under warp tension. So what's this yarn going to behave like once it's under warp tension? Because it's quite elastic and it's a um, you know it's, it's a super wash yarn. And in the end, it kind of it came out to sort of 16 wraps per inch. So at this point, I've set it at eight ends per inch, but we will see. Um, and then on the facing page, it just rotated through. I have all of the um, uh, information for my GCW, the things that I need to be thinking about in this project, because that's what I'm working toward is here. This sample, I'll put on a sample of three yards. I need to use two colors. I've got, you know, um, the different the different things that I need to show mastery for. Uh, so that's, you know, open on two sides, exchanging color, uh, top colors. So that's where you um, have stripes going um, perpendicularly and your uh, top layer is changing, but your two sides are open. Uh, closed on two sides, so that's where we're weaving a tube. So this is all double weave. And then open on one side, which is double width cloth, which is what I'm working on right now. So I'll throw in a piece of fishing line or a piece of 2-8 cotton on the one side where my seam is. And I wrote here that I'm gonna be threading at one, two, three, four, but I actually sent a text to Felicia over the weekend of, of School of Sweet Georgia, Felicia, Felicia Lowe, if you don't uh, watch uh, Low Meat Saloon, I would highly recommend checking that her work there out. Um, I sent a message to her and I was like, I've seen you know all these different threadings for double weave. Like, do you, what one did you kind of settle on? Because she's putting together all the double weave content for the School of Sweet Georgia, and she's like, you know, in the end, I I use one three two four, and I just thought perfect makes sense. Um, I was trying to work it out in my head, and I was just like. I, I need something really, really simple. So I'm threading mine one, three, two, four. So the uh, first and second shafts are the light and third and fourth are dark. So I'm not actually using light and dark, but if you look at my um, warping, at my, my warp chains here, that I didn't chain them, but if you look at my warp here, um, I have, you know, blue, needing to go on shaft one and two, and then grape, uh, the grapefruit, the red, going on three and four. So it's really easy to thread one, three, two, four, one, three, two, four, and just knowing which colors need to go on which shaft. And we'll get into more of that in future episodes and more like we'll get into the weeds and I'll show you what that looks like on, on paper. So that'll, that'll be coming up in, in future. I just need to get it onto the loom and get it threaded and, and get it working. And I'll be able to show you some video of what that looks like. So very excited about this project and looking forward to having it on the loom ready to go. So thank you everyone for joining me today. This was kind of a long episode of Welford Weaves. I felt like I had a lot to share with you and a lot to catch you up on so that we've laid the foundation for where we're going in the future, in future episodes. I also have a warp going on the four shaft jack, uh, which is the stash crap crackle pop towels from Jane Stafford. That's just purely for, for gifts. And I just need to get that warped, get it wo woven off so that I have some, some stuff to give away for the kids, teachers for Christmas time. And also playing with crackle. I'm excited about that. And the other thing that I am working on is uh, some overshot sampling, which is going to be for the Patreon uh, content for November. So I'm working on some overshot samples that I will share with you in our Patreon support content stuff that we release every month uh, for, we're currently working on our breeding color study on Radner that will come to a conclusion at the end of this year. And um, I've been working on the Radner spins for a while. As you can see, I'm working on plying back here. And uh, I've been sampling some of the blue that I finished off at the Jane with that leftover warp, the other half that I put off to the side is being used for the overshot samples just to see what I might want to create um, with the with the Radner. So I need to get that warped up and get what, that onto one of the looms ASAP. That's, that's a big push. So sampling uh, the overshot in the meantime and then deciding what I want to do for the actual weaving is, is coming up shortly. So lots going on between now and Christmas time. I hope I get an opportunity to get on here and tell you all about it. 
get some real time uh, filming and footage for you so that you can actually see the work in progress. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and post them down below and I will get to them as soon as I can. And maybe even uh, some questions for future episodes. That would be really great if I could um, build some of that as well. So let me know what you're curious about. Let me know what you want to talk about and I will be here. Bye everyone.